Hello, welcome everybody. Welcome to Book Passage Live, our conversations with authors program. We're here today to talk about a new thrilling mystery that I'm really excited about. I know everybody is really excited about. It's uh, going to be Reese Bowen's newest Georgie mystery in her Royal Spinus series, God Rest Ye Royal Gentlemen. It's the 15th book in the series, and it's coming at the perfect time because as we're telling everybody, uh, this holiday season is going to be crazy, and you should buy your Christmas presents and your Christmas books early, and Reese yeah. has given you the perfect opportunity to do that here by giving this uh, book to us now. It comes out next Tuesday the 12th, and Reese will sign any books that you buy, so please purchase them online at our, over the phone, bookpassage.com, anywhere you can get a hold of us. And let me tell you a little bit about your authors today. We've got Reese Bowen, who is a New York Times bestselling author. She was nominated for almost every major award in misery writing, including the Edgar, and has won many, including both the Agatha and Anthony Awards. She's also the author of the Molly Murphy, Murphy Mystery Series and is set in turn of the century New York in Constable Evans Mysteries, which are set in Wales, as well as two internationally best-selling standalone novels. She was born in England and divides her time between North Carif Northern California and Arizona. And in conversation with Reese today is Jen McKinley, who is a New York Times USA Today and Publishers Weekly best-selling author. She's written several mystery and romance series. She's all, she is also the winner of the RT Reviewer's Choice Award for Romantic Comedy and the Fresh Fiction Award for Best Cozy Mystery. Her work has been translated into multiple languages all over the country. She's also a TEDx speaker, and she's always happy to talk books, writing, reading, the creative process to anyone who cares to listen. And she lives in sunny Arizona in a house that is overrun with kids, pets, and her husband's guitars. And I want to remind <laughs> everybody watching today that uh, Reese will answer any questions you put in the YouTube chat. So please feel free throughout the event to put any comments, any questions you have in the chat, and I will get them to the authors. Thank you both so much for being here and welcome. Oh, hi. 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 hi, everyone. Thank you for having us. Of course, my voice just gave out. <laughs> Reese, I'm just going to start with how much I loved the book, as you know. Um, the thing that always gets me, I don't write historical. Um, Georgie's had quite, let's start with those, as we were saying before, who don't know Georgie or who are new to Georgie. Let's, can you give us a little bit background on Georgie? But for me, as a writer who's totally intimidated by writing a historical, what made you decide to go this far back and with Georgie like what what was the spark well this series actually happened by accident I my my publisher kept saying to me before we can't really break you out until you write us a big dark standalone novel so I kept okay. thinking all these awful things you know like ch children being kidnapped and serial killers and missing girls and then I thought oh god do I want to spend six months in such darkness and I thought you know, you turn on the television and everything's so gloomy. I thought, no, I don't. So I thought, okay, what would be the most unlikely sleuth I could come up with? How about if she was royal, but she was penniless? And I thought it has to be in the 1930s because what a great time that was. It's poised between two world wars. And yet we've got this time of enormous contrast. You know, we've got the Great Depression. We've got haves and have nots. We've got people lining up for bread. And we've got people like Bertie Wooster who are drinking champagne from a slipper on a yacht on the Med. So we really have these enormous contrasts and so many interesting characters. You know, immediately I thought, oh, Prince of Wales, Mrs. Simpson, Noel Coward, Hitler. You know, it's just too many, too many wonderful characters to, to write about. And so I thought it has to be someone in the, in the 30s. So L Lady Georgie, I started to write in the first person. And her voice just came to me instantly. In fact, if you look at the first chapter of Her Royal Spinus, which was the first book in the series, 15 books ago now, those five pages are absolutely identical to what I wrote when it was really her first stream of consciousness. So her voice came to me instantly. And in that first book, she, as I said, is penniless. She's stuck at her brother's castle in Scotland. And I mean, what future does a young girl have? She's not educated for any job even if there were jobs, but it's the Great Depression. All she's educated mm -hmm. for is walking around with a book on her head, knowing where to seat a bishop at a dinner table. These aren't really marketable skills. And so really the only option for her is, as she puts it, to marry one of those chinless, spineless and half imbecile princes that still seem to litter Europe. 
and she chooses no. So she flees from the castle, comes down to London, and for the first time she's on her own without servants. And that's a big eye opener. You know, how does the milk get to the doorstep? How do you make tea and toast? Who lights the fire? So it's a steep learning curve for those first few books in which she tries her hand at various jobs that all end disastrously. But it's up to book 15 now, and things have gone slightly better for her in that at the very beginning of the series, she meets this rather gorgeous chap called Darcy, and she can't believe that he's interested in her, and she thinks his only aim is to get her into bed. So she's very wary of him. She also thinks he's a bad boy. So she's attracted, but a little bit scared. Anyway, as the series have progressed, the relationship has progressed too, until now they're a happily married couple. And we'll go on from there, shall we? Yeah. I, I have a very soft spot for Darcy. He's one of my book boyfriends. <laughs> oh, well, do you know, you know, people have, keep asking me, they say, well, when you chose his name, did you have anything in mind? And I said, every time I write about him, I see Colin Firth coming out of that lake <laughs> in, in Pride and Prejudice. Yeah. I, have a poster, I have a poster on my wall, which is a poster of that. And it says, you are... I." Either you think Mr. Colin Firth as Mr. Darcy is the most fantastic thing ever, or you're wrong. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> well, I am a Colin Firth Darcy girl, so yeah, yes, yes, a hundred times yes. And I do when I'm reading um, Her Royal Spiness, I see your Darcy as you know definitely has some Firth attributes. <laughs> Yeah, well, you write a compelling hero, I must say. Yeah, well, he's he's you know what I wanted to do at the very beginning of the series, I wanted to make him madly attractive but in a sort of dangerous way and Georgie doesn't know for several books whether she can trust him or not and I you know I really like to keep that up for as long as possible because it's kind of a fascinating thing to me you're attracted to someone but you think maybe he's not quite who he says he is and so it, you know it reminds me it harkens back to and I've had this conversation the if you look at uh, like um Elizabeth Peters mm-hmm wrote as Barbara Michaels and she wrote a lot of those suspense she always had a hero that was suspect like you didn't quite know if you could trust him and I love that because you know as a as a reader yeah it, it pulls you along through because every book you're like yeah, yeah. Is, you know so brilliant to put it in a series yeah I mean when you think back to movies you've loved movies like charade when you had Cary Grant and you didn't know if he was on the good side or the bad side you know that that's fascinating to me because oh absolutely it, honestly, it's living vicariously you wouldn't really like to be involved with someone who was dangerous you couldn't trust no, 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 it's no, no, really no, nice no, to no. fantasize about it isn't it <laughs> it's like exactly it's fictionally perfect yeah I see we have a question and um uh, it's are you sympathetic Kat Peters asks, are you sympathetic towards Mrs. Simpson? She seems to have been uh, vilified, villainized in real life for choosing love or was it love? Now I know because I read your book, <laughs> I think. And yeah. I guess I did have that question in mind. And I know like we have to remind readers that when you write, your works do not necessarily reflect the opinions of the author. But I was curious when I was reading it, are, did this book reflect your feelings towards Mrs. Simpson? Well, if you've read the series, you'll know that I'm not a huge fan of Mrs. Simpson. Um, she's popped up before, yeah. Yeah, yeah she's <laughs> popped up in nearly all of the books. She's, it started at the very beginning because one, in the very first book, the Queen gives Georgie a little assignment. She's just learned that the Prince of Wales has this new woman he's interested in, and she's an American divorcee. And she's quite unsuitable. And the queen says to Georgie, they're having, they're going to this house party. Would you go and spy on them and to see if there's anything in it? Because I need to know if there is. So we've gone on from there. We've seen her over, over many books. And mm -hmm. uh, the thing is, when I do historical, I really do my research very well. I read sort of every biography I can get my hands on. And I read every opinion I can get my hands on. And in America, it was seen as this great love story. You know, he's giving up the throne for the woman he loves. And I think that was true. It was true from his point of view. But she, I mm -hmm. think, was a complete 
complete schema. I think she, and the thing is she was so worldly and she was so sophisticated and she'd managed so well. She was a very ordinary woman who'd worked herself into, as you can see, the top layers of British society. But she really believed she could be queen, which was completely impossible because if he was going to be king, he's then head of the Church of England. And that mm -hmm. means that the Church of England does not allow divorce. So as the king and the head of the Church of England, he couldn't marry a divorced woman. But um, she really thought that he was so powerful that when he became king, he could issue a decree and say, the woman I love is now going to be queen. But of course, that could never happen. But so I think that's what she had in mind all along. And when I write about her, all of the biographies I've written, I've read, she really was a very bitchy woman. I mean, I don't think yeah. I could... I couldn't make her as bitchy as she really was. She, <laughs> she loved to make really cutting, cutting remarks. She loved to really poke fun at people. You know, she had a group of, she had a, a field day with the then Duke of York, the one who became uh, King George VI and his right. wife. She used to call her cookie because she looked like somebody's cook. And then she always used to refer to her as the dowdy duchess. And he, she used to make fun of his stammer. She'd be sitting at a party and she'd go, well, I, 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 uh, 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 who do you guess I am? And everybody would roar with laughter. Oh, that's and, awful. Yeah, and then she used to, and the princesses, she could, they, both of them, they couldn't stand Elizabeth because she was such a good child. They used to call her Shirley Temple because she was too, too perfect. They liked Margaret because she was slightly naughty. But um, so, so, you know, she was, she loved to make fun of people and she had had this strange hold over him. I, you know, the last few days I've been doing all these Zoom meetings, we've been discussing what was that hold? Because I don't think it was sexual. I think she was very, if you look at her, she's very mannish. She, yeah. you know, she's got this ma very boyish figure, mannish face, and she doesn't sort of exude sexual temptation to me. Uh, and he, by this time, he was 40, he was over 40. So what was the hold? Um, in a way, I think she used to boss him around mercilessly. You know, if you were, maybe it was the novelty, like had he never, I mean, growing up as a prince, the Prince yeah. of Wales. Oh, we should mention that in the in your series, he's yeah. her, he's Georgie's cousin. That's why she's so yeah. fascinated. Yeah, he's Georgie's cousin, yes. Yeah. And, and they are close. So yeah, yeah, yeah. And Georgie's known him all her life. And Georgie really mm. likes him. I mean, everybody mm. liked him. He he exuded charm. The yeah. average person in the street loved him. He was very good with the man in the street. You know, he was the sort who could chat, chat and shake hands. And every girl was in love with him when he was younger. He was very good looking. And he had oh, yeah. this boyish charm still in his 40s. But she had this hold over him. When you're a prince, you are a royal family. You have to call him sir, even if you're a close friend. And um, she would sit there on the sofa and she'd snap her fingers and she'd say, David, come over here. And everybody would gasp and he'd come over and say, <laughs> you know, what did you need, my darling? You know, and um, so mm -hmm. what was this hold? I mean, in a way, I think maybe she was the mother figure he never had because his own mother was clearly disproving of him. I mean, the fact that after World War I, he was really expected to buckle down, to take over some duties of state from his father, who was not, his health wasn't very good. He was expected to marry well, a European princess, produce the heir to the throne. And he didn't do any of these things. Mm. His mother was very worried that the whole of the monarchy would be at stake once he took over. So I think he sensed her disapproval. She made it quite clear, her, his and so I think Mrs. Simpson was a mother figure in a way, but also I wonder if there wasn't that that sort of tinge of dominatrix. Perhaps he was the sort of man who loved to be dominated, you know, psychiatrist uh -huh. haven't said. <laughs> <laughs> it would be interesting if someone could do a, a deep dive yeah. into that. Yeah. I, yeah, I find that fascinating. I think we all know people. I think it's what's great about it is the way you presented it as you're telling us about it now you have those little you know moments in the book exactly like that where she bosses him around and even as an american who's not you know super invested in the monarchy you know as it was even i was oh, i can't believe she talked to him like that you know yeah, and you can yeah. and you really feel it through georgie's perspective and, yeah, and yeah. the same thing the bewilderment where georgie's just you know but what i did find interesting is the dynamic i'm going to jump over to uh, darcy and georgie yeah. And I wanted to ask you, because you are writing about a very different time period. 
and the relationship between husbands and wives and the expectations. Do you find it difficult? And this is again where I, I can't fathom writing a historical card. <laughs> Do you find it difficult being a contemporary? And I, you and I are friends and I know you very well. And, you know, you're very liberated. You're very liberal. You're clearly, you know, a woman of, of substance and, and your own. Oh, yes. <laughs> Is it hard to write females who didn't have, I mean, it's like you were saying when Georgie started, she didn't even know how to make tea. Yeah. Is it hard to put yourself in that place mentally where, I hate to say it, but women really were second class citizens. We didn't have rights. We didn't have our own autonomy. Is that hard? Is that a hard shift or does it make you come out of it and appreciate your own life? Or do you find that your modernness kind of creeps into the book? You know, it's an, always a very, a very fine line to tread because until very recently, women really were second-class citizens. I mean, I've been amazed in my own lifetime. If you look back at the TV shows of the 50s and the early 60s, you have the woman wearing the little apron and she's at home and the man's coming back from work. And if the boy's been mad, she says, you wait till your father gets back. Um, so it's dad who's the head of the household. You look, I love Lucy. She was terrified because she bought a hat without asking Ricky's permission. I mean, that's, uh, you know, to us is, is abhorrent. And I found, uh, I think Darcy and Georgie have quite a good relationship in terms of balance of power, you know, it, it, and now it's nicely balanced because she's the one who's inherited the house. So he's, <laughs> li he's living grace and favor in a house that she's inherited from her, her godfather. So, you know, in a way he's slightly beholden to her and he can't boss her around. I don't think he'd, he'd want to protect her, but not boss her. But in some mm. of the older books, for example, you know, I write the Molly Murphy series too. And I get all these emails saying, oh, I can't stand Daniel, he's so bossy. And, and I say, well, he's a man of his time. He would expect to be the head of the household. He, he would expect to make the, make the decisions for the household because that's what men did. And in many ways, he's very enlightened for a man of his time because he hasn't forbidden Molly to work. Sometimes she's gone off and solved little cases somewhere. He can't have her officially be a detective because that would undermine his status at the police department. But he hasn't said to her, you know, I want you to stay home and clean my shoes, which most, most husbands would. You know, the time I write about in the early 1900s, none of my women can vote. And in fact, in New York, a man was allowed to beat his wife with a stick no thicker than his thumb, which was the rule of thumb, which is interesting. Um, so uh, <laughs> you know, I, I am always conscious of the fact that in in my historicals, the man is the head of household. He is the one with the power. Usually he's the one who earns the money and he's the provider. So as the provider, he thinks of himself as the one who makes the decisions. But Darcy, because Darcy's providing is so um, nebulous. Uh, I mean, I should yeah. say, Darcy doesn't really have a job. He does something. We By this book, we tend to suspect he's a spy. And he, he works undercover for the British government at times, but he doesn't earn a steady income. And so he's not providing for Georgie in that way. So um, it's an interesting relationship in the balance of power, I think. I thought you did a really, I mean, I thought it, as I was reading it and I've read most of your series, you know, very exciting. Um, and it's been fun to watch them grow. But it, it is definitely, you know, a different dynamic. But I do like the way you, and I think that you kind of nailed it in your answer. It's like as a modern author mm -hmm. writing a historical, but not wanting to use the rule of thumb, which would have been accurate, mm -hmm. you find a workaround. So yeah. you're inheriting yeah. in the house. And, and she's, a, I mean, she's, what, how far is she from the throne now? I forget. Like what number in line is she? 35, 35. Okay, so, so she's like 35. So it would have to be really bad for her. Yeah, so <laughs> unless there's a major pandemic, she's not going to be queen. <laughs> and I think there's, that kind of gives them a little bit of balance too. Yeah. You know, Darcy, yeah. although he's also from... A yeah, he's good from background. nobility, but lesser nobility than she is, you know. He's and that and matters. Omar and she's Lady Georgie, so, you know, there's a, there's a little hierarchy. And I noticed she, uh, when she needs to, she wields Lady Georgie. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> she makes the conscious choice instead of being Mrs. to be Lady. I thought that was genius. Yeah, like when she it goes was, 
to see to, to the employment agency to try and yes. get, get a cook. She sort of says, oh, this is Lady Georgiana. And they go, oh, yes. No. Oh, no. And then they still couldn't help her. But um, the other thing that I really love about your, and I know you do copious research, as you've mentioned, you have so many things that are just tiny little things that really put us there in the moment. And because Queenie is one of my favorite, we'll talk about a Queenie moment <laughs> when she's trying to buy a candy bar <laughs> out of a machine and she loses and at each, and there were so many things like, first of all, I didn't know they had candy machines back then. So that was like, whoa, no way. Yeah. And then second of all, it cost a penny. And then she, you know, smacked it and she got in trouble because she lost her penny and she didn't get her candy bar. It's like, where do you, find research like that that's not in a biography of wallace simpson so what sources are you using to because that really grounds it and it also just makes it fascinating to me yeah i think well little things like that you know i have uh several books which are com compilations of women's magazines from the 30s so i can see how much you paid for anything and what the advert you know, often what the advertisements were told you what was important at a time. You know, the people loved their chocolates because it was a time, obviously it was a time for a lot of people, depression, recovering from depression still, but people didn't have that much. And so all the treats mm -hmm. would have been the small things. A bar of Cadbury's chocolate would have been a big thing. And people in England, as you know, eat far more, many more sweets than we do. They're always eating sweets all the time. So, you know, uh, the, the, the chocolate machines were, uh, uh, you know, on the stations and things where you could put your money in and a bar of chocolate. And of course, Queenie being rather ham fisted, she, I should say, <laughs> we don't know, she's Georgie's former maid, who's now her cook. And she's been a pretty much a disaster at both of these things. But anyway, she's rather a large lady and she, <laughs> she puts some money in to get her bar of chocolate because she's starving and it, it, it takes her penny and it won't give her so she starts hammering on the machine so she's dragged away and because of that the servants all miss their train so they're not very pleased with her but there are lots of queenie moments all the time because she can't go very long without a, a major disaster is she you would you say she's your comic foil uh predominantly through the series it's usually queenie to the rescue with that moment that breaks the because you know when you're writing a mystery it's all tension because yeah. she also has the button in the pudding in this book which is hilarious yeah we, we can't tell you have to read that scene i think to get yeah that's a good one <laughs> but yeah. But, um, yeah no she's definitely obviously in in a lot of these books has been great tension um <laughs> And um, uh, and obviously to have Queenie around, like when she falls into the oubliette in in Transylvania, you know things like that. <laughs> that was a good one too. Plastic, you know, and you need yeah. that because uh, you know I'm writing mysteries, but I'm not writing the sort of mystery that you you know you're going <gasps> all the time. You have to remind everybody this is a mystery, but it's also a romp, and you're you know you're going to have a good time when you read it. There might be a, a crime to solve, but you're not going to weep or bite your fingernails. No, no. There is a, there is. I don't want to give away too much, but there is a scene with a zipper, and I didn't get. I'm a librarian by trade, so I didn't get a chance to look it up. But were I, I have to ask? I know zippers were they pretty new back then? They or zippers had been invented for a long time before then, and they'd been used first of all in the side of boots. But okay. um, yeah, they were. I mean, obviously, the person who's wearing the zipper would have had the latest from Paris. So yeah, they would have been around. They, and it was a little befuddling. <laughs> they were horrible. They were, they were like metal zippers in those days, so they would have been quite cold next to your skin. But um, yeah. yeah. Uh, no, it, that, and as you know, when you write, it's little things like that you have to do the research on. You're writing, and then you go, wait a minute, would they have had zippers? So then you have to go and look it up. And um, Exactly. And that was my thought. I'm like, I know that they have them, but how long have they had them? And so that, it's, it's all those little details that ground it. And then you mentioned the designer of the dress, which... So you probably looked up and found a dress and then yeah. just put it on that person. Yeah. And um, yeah, it's, it, as you say, all those little tiny things that you need to need to check up on all the time. Okay. There's one thing I have to add and I don't see, this is where I'm very nervous when I talk to an author whose book is coming out because I don't want to do spoilers, but this is more a factual thing. The clocks of Sandringham. Is that true? The that there, that, no, no. 
No, no did you cuts. make that up? I made that up. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I was uh, just like, did they? Because I'm kind of nutty about time, but I'm not that nutty. <laughs> yeah. you know, there are plenty of plenty of ghosts and things haunting around the royal family, but Sandringham's mm-hmm. not one of them because it's a fairly new house. Um, it was built in the mid 1800s for the then Prince of Wales. It's not a royal palace. It's a big okay. It's a house. It's a big yeah. country house, and it belongs to belongs to them privately, not the state. So I should say that this the royal family always spends Christmas at Sandringham House in Norfolk, mm-hmm. out in the country. It's their, their tradition. So we are with the royal family at Sandringham House at Christmas, and it's Christmas 1935, and King George is very ill, and he's not expected to live very long. So the Prince of mm-hmm. Wales is summoned, and, of course, he brings someone with him because he doesn't want to be parted from her. Um, so, yeah, I mean, we should, I should set the scene, shouldn't I, probably. And yes, yes. The, way, the fact that Georgie is looking forward to it. It's her first Christmas married. She's mm-hmm. in a very nice house now, and she says to Darcy, wouldn't it be great if we had a little house party with all the people I love? So she sends out all the invitations and they all come back saying, sorry, can't make it. So she's stuck with just her grandfather, who she does love, but it's going to be a very quiet Christmas. But then her brother and sister-in-law, who she doesn't like so much, descend upon them because their own boiler's broken. So it looks like it's going to be grandfather plus Binky and Fig, her two least favorite people in the world. But then Darcy gets a letter from his aunt Ermintrude, who is now, she's the woman, we only know her from the wedding when she sent this incredibly awful picture painting that she'd painted as a wedding present. And it's so ghastly, it went straight into the attic. Um, but she invites them, she says, do come to a house party and bring your guests. I want to have a lot merry house party at my house, lots of people around me. And so Georgie thinks, oh, thank heavens, Queenie doesn't have to cook for everybody. So she's very relieved. They go off to Norfolk and she discovers that late, uh, Aunt Ermintrude was in fact once lady in waiting to Queen Mary. And Queen Mary is very interested because Georgie's come back and she's desperate to see Georgie. Georgie doesn't like this because uh, Queen Mary in the past has had little assignments for Georgie that haven't always been comfortable. So, you know, having come to a nice house party, she now finds that Queen Mary's dying to see her. Oh, golly, what's this going to be? The other thing, too, is that they come down for the first dinner, and there's a big dinner table, and there's two empty places. And they say, oh, are we expecting more guests? And Ermintrude says rather coyly, well, yes, I think they should arrive soon. And it turns out it's the Prince of Wales and Mrs. Simpson. So that was that was the, the, the reason for the whole house party is that the Prince of Wales is funding it so that he can keep his lady love very close to Sandringham House. So that's where we start off. I loved it. I loved I loved feeling like I was a part of the, the family. You even have uh, moments with the princesses, uh, Elizabeth and Margaret, when they're young. Yeah, I love it. It's so I've touching. Books. I've done several books with the royal family when we've had little moments with the princesses, and I try to keep them as true to life as possible. Either things mm-hmm. that the, you know the princesses are quoted as saying, um, and or, or the way they've really behaved. The fact that Elizabeth is always very polite and very circumspect, and Margaret always tends to be really cheeky and very naughty. My favorite, <laughs> my favorite one of those was in a book when they were quite a bit younger when. Um, that uh, Georgie meets them at the stables at Balmoral and she sort of says, hello, Elizabeth, hello, Margaret. And Margaret looks at her, Margaret was only about three and says, I'm a princess, so you have to call me Princess Margaret. And so Georgie says, "Uh, in that case, I'm a lady, so you have to call me Lady Georgie. So Margaret thinks this over and she turns to her governess and she says, is a lady better than a princess? And her governess says, we hope a princess will grow up to be a lady. And that was a real quote. So I had to use that because it was so lovely. That is lovely. Oh, what fun. The research must be fantastic. I have to ask on a personal note, because you have been so um, immersed in this. Uh, are you a monarchist? Do you Are you very much loyal to the throne? Do you see it going on forever? Do you worry about it? And I only ask because when I was in London touring one of my, you know, research for a series of mine, we had this crazy bus driver and most of the tour bus was foreigners, a lot of Americans. And we got to talk to him, he was very flamboyant, but at one point he said, 
I just, I don't understand how you Americans sleep at night without Queen Elizabeth looking after you. (laughs) Well, you know, the interesting thing is Queen Elizabeth and her duties cost Mm -hmm. about, I think, seven times less than a president. And you don't have to worry about every four years getting changed for someone you might hate. You know, Mm -hmm. she was was raised for the position. And the fact that it's non-political, I think, is wonderful. Other, Other countries have... Um, a premier as well as a prime minister. So they have the non-political position who will always be the head of state with the dignity who can entertain. And I think that's Queen Elizabeth's position is is that it's wonderful, is that she meets other heads of state. She's the official one who welcomes them. And there's no politics behind it at all because whoever the prime minister is, she must welcome him. She must talk to him. She must get along with him. She really has no power apart from the advisory power, she can say to her prime minister, are you sure it's a wise thing to nationalize the railways? Um, You know, she can say things like that, but she can't say, I command that you don't nationalize the railways. So I think, and the fact is, uh, people say, oh, these royals, they cost a lot of money. They work so hard. You know, the queen is over 90, 95 she's going to be. And uh, before the pandemic, she did over 300 appearances in a year. That's almost one a day, all year. And you and I know we've been on book tours and we've been on book tours maybe for a week or two weeks. It's really tiring. You know, every day you get up, you go to an airport, you're flown somewhere else, a car takes you somewhere. You probably do a radio or TV. You get dressed, you go and do an event in the evening, talk to people, sign books, come to the hotel, fall asleep, next day do the same thing. Mm -hmm. And after a week you think, oh, I'd love to be home with some grilled cheese. And um, <laughs> yeah, true. she does that almost every day, all year. She has to be gracious. She has to be smiling. She has to be knowledgeable enough to say, oh, how interesting. So at your factory, you make all sorts of screws. That's wonderful, you know. And, um, yeah. and she has to seem to be interested when they tell her things. And she has to accept bouquets from little kids and shake hands and and never look as if she's bored because there are always press cameras that are waiting to catch. If she ever yawned, they say the queen was bored. So she has to sit there with this intelligent smile on her face. <laughs> you should be queen. You're very good at that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, I, I, so I think, I, I, you know, I'm very glad that we've got William and then we've got George because I think they will continue to do a wonderful job. And I think, uh, they're, well, they're a huge asset to England because the pomp and circumstance behind the royal family brings in all those tourists. So That's what I was going to say. I mean, the first thing you do when you get to London is go to Buckingham Palace, watch the changing of the guard, buy your, you know, yeah, yeah. Mem- queen memorabilia. Yeah. Uh, you skipped over Charles, though, I'm just going to say. Well, I mean, I don't <laughs> think he's not going to be around that long, I don't think, you know. So we'll, we'll see. I'm sure the queen, her mother lived to 103, so perhaps she'll do the same. So... Um, Which would be great. I love her. I just yeah, adore her. I, yeah, I don't think Charles will step down in favor of William, William, as everybody hopes, because I think they're all brought up to do their duty. That's why I don't think mm-hmm. she'll step down unless she was really ill. So I think yeah. she's going as long as she can. But um, there is no retirement. It's kind of like the Pope. You know, you're yeah, in. Yeah. You're in until you're till you're not. It's kind of like writers. You know. <laughs> yeah, if you're gonna die at your desk. <laughs> we'll be like this. Um, no, that's fantastic. I see there's another question um, in Sybil. And she said, I'm already wondering how the next book will be with the year of the three kings. Do you already have ideas for how to play this? So have you thought about the next book? Uh, yeah, I've actually started on the next book and I'm, I'm, I'm taking it very slowly this year because um, I don't want to jump too much to jar us too much. Um, the, king, uh, the next book, The King Has Now Died, obviously her cousin David has become king. But the interesting thing is that nobody in England knows about Mrs. Simpson because the, the press has a gentleman's agreement not to mention her. So if you lived in a foreign country, if you lived in America or Switzerland, the press would have pictures of them together. 
Um, uh, but in England, no, only only the well-traveled know. The average man in the street doesn't know anything about her. So she's still in the background. She's still finalizing her divorce, etc. And you have to have enough time between the divorce and getting married. Um, so the king's still working out what he can do because he wants to marry her. So um, during this time, I've got Georgie's doing other things. One of them will be very important, which you'll find out if you read the book. I'm not going to tell you. Um, nope. but so I thought the next book would be to take her in the springtime to Paris because her friend Belinda has gone back there to, she's been studying, uh, improving her fashion design by sort of being an apprentice to Coco Chanel. And so she's gone back to Paris. So Georgie is going to find herself there and have something very dramatic happen on a runway. So uh, uh, that I love it. So, you know, who can who can resist writing about Paris when you can't travel, you write about Paris. And it's funny, people say to me, there's so much food in your books. You know, do you love <laughs> do you love cooking? And I say, well, no, I don't love cooking, but I do love eating. I would love to have I would love to have, you know, um, one of these nice cooks and um, uh and to come up and, I, and say, you know, what would you like for dinner, my lady? And I'd say, well, I think we'll start with the pheasant in aspic, you know. And um, <laughs> to me, I'll be over for dinner. Yeah, <laughs> well, yeah, soon. Yeah, any any um, dinner that I don't have to cook, I think is wonderful. But I do love reading about food, and I love, you know, I love reading like travel books in which they discuss the food, and I love writing about the food and. I love eating the food. So everything. Well, at this house party, you have, you do mention that. I mean, I even caught on the food. And of course, the concern that Queenie's not up to snuff as a cook. But um, yeah, even I was thinking, oh, a mince pie would be really good right now. <laughs> yeah. no, I think, especially if you're writing about Christmas, that's the whole thing, mm -hmm. is I wanted that wonderful old English Christmas atmosphere. Because if you have the big burning Yule log and the greenery around the house and the candles flickering and the carol singers outside and on the food, the mint, hot mince pies, the hot wassail bowl, um, the turkey, the flaming Christmas pudding, all that creates this wonderful feeling of, of safety and contentment. And then you throw something bad into that. And you have yeah, to, you murder somebody. <laughs> you have the reader going, oh, didn't expect that, you know, which is, no. which is, you, know, you have a noir book, every page on that book, you're expecting something bad to happen. Mm -hmm. But in a book like this, you're cheating, the, you know, you're, you're, you're leading them astray. You're leading them along thinking, isn't this lovely and happy? And aren't we all having a good time? Oh, wait, there's a body. Um, so, <laughs> so, well, and in this book, there's right. so much, yeah. you occupy the reader with so much, um, uh, some of my favorite characters from the Georgie series are granddad. So it was nice to see him in the beginning. Yeah. And yeah. then Georgie's mother, you've given Wallace the perfect foil, you know, oh, the yeah. one who can keep up with her with the little dig. Yeah. And she's delightful to watch in it. So you have, so when I'm reading this with Georgie, you have all the, the because we all love the holidays, but the holidays come with hostessing angst. Is the family going to get along? You know, there's always that anxiety, that, that little bit of stress just to take away from the Yule log and all the good stuff. And Georgie really has to navigate all this, you know, and then boom, it gets even crazier. Yeah. So you do an excellent job of like, oh, everything's nice. Oh, it's going to work out. And you're kind of in Georgie's head like, oh, okay, it's going to be all right. Okay, change the plan. It'll be fine. Give it again. All right, it's good. And now, yeah. so well done. Well yeah. done. Uh, yeah, and, and, you know, Georgie's mother, the first time her mother met Mrs. Simpson, um, it was quite clear that Georgie's mother was going to give as good as she gets. And so the, mm -hmm. these two women, they love to stab each other in the back, which makes for great writing. And it's funny because I, I was doing one of these the other day and Barbara Peters said to me, well, you're in charge. You can. And I said, no, I'm not in charge. You know, these characters, they rush off and do what they want. I can't stop them, you know. Don't you find that once you've created them, there's no way you can rein them in. They're, they're off doing what they want to, saying what they want to. And so I'm just sort of running one step behind going, whoa, I don't think you should go in there. There might be a... Oh, <laughs> <laughs> oh there is. <laughs> no, it's... And I think that's the sign. You know, when I was first starting out as a writer and I would hear authors talk about their characters and say, oh, well, the character decided it might be like... You know, but now that I'm a writer, I'm like, oh, yeah, I get that. You know, I'm sure you've probably had characters that you tried to kill off and they refused. Uh, yeah, absolutely. That happened. Yeah. yeah, it's good times as a writer. You're like, but my outline. 
yeah. Well, I don't outline, so I've learned you. Oh, Lord. You don't outline? They, you they, don't outline? They have you, no, they have, I have no outline. I start knowing little bits, and, and I, I, I usually know who, who's going to be killed, and I probably know why. But, um, okay. you know, I start off, I put them, I know my environment. I know the situation I want to put them in. George is going to a lovely house party near the royal family at Sandringham. Something bad might happen to the royal family. Go. You know, that's, that's pretty much what I know. Um, you might I, need to lie down after this. <laughs> I'm an outliner. So this is when I pray meet someone who's not an outliner. And I thought I, I thought you were an outliner. No, I'm, no, but I'm always is, shocked. If I have an outline, then I'd have to obey that outline. Whereas, um, you know, sometimes my characters <laughs> talking and they will say, well, I'm leaving, leaving for Paris tomorrow. And I go, well, no, you're not. And they go, well, I am now. And then I think, well, that, well, my outline says you're not leaving for Paris tomorrow. They go, well, sorry, I'm off, you know, so it would be useless. They don't, they don't obey anything I tell them anyway. And um, oh, that's hilarious. And I think, you know, too, if I'm surprised, then you're surprised. So I really like to be surprised when I like, I write, I like, you know, my characters to say and do things I really haven't thought. And um, mm. so it, it's, it's fun, you know, I get that. Yeah. Yeah. You write uh, standalone historicals as well. I do. And yeah. I know we're celebrating God Rest Ye Royal Gentlemen, but I wanted to touch on those as well. Those are, are they all World War II era? No, I've done um, the first one. In Farley Field was World War II. Right. The, the Tuscan Child was World War II. And then we had uh, the, the Victory, Queen Victoria. But no, Victory Garden, which was World War I. Oh, no. Then we oh, had World War I, okay. And then we came back to World War II and closer to the present with the latest mm -hmm. one, which is the Venice sketchbook. So I'm very mm -hmm. attracted to World War II. And the next one will also be that. And it's called Where the Sky Begins. And it's about a woman who's bombed out of her house in London. Um, so uh, I think, you know, there's so many stories to tell about World War II. And the interesting thing I do, I won't say I outline, but I do plot those ahead because they're very complicated. You know, several of them, like yeah. the Venice, Venice sketchbook takes place in three different time periods. So mm -hmm. when you bring in information from one of those that will impact one of the others, it takes a lot more plotting. So they, right, they right. yeah. It's just Georgie, you know, I have to let her go ahead and have a fun time and terrible things happen with Queenie and I just follow along. Well, there is a certain comfort in the, the cozier mystery where there is an inherent structure. So the outline is not as critical. I mean, you know, the body's got to show up and they, you know, yeah. they have solved the, hopefully solved the mystery. That is the point. Yeah. But your, your standalones are, yes, they're much more weighty and you do jump timelines, which just yeah. is also impressive to me. Have you ever considered writing a straight contemporary? Has that ever occurred to you or you're happy in the, um, in the history? Well, you know, the Constable Evans were reasonably contemporary. They were, they were, they were contemporary when I was writing them, which was in the mid nineties. Mm -hmm. um, and that was nice because it was Wales and it was, I think the thing I have against contemporaries, especially contemporary mysteries, is that the, it's so impersonal now, you know, you've got your CSI and your blood spatters and DNA, and you can, you can solve everything without ever using the little gray cells like Echo Poirot could. Um, mm -hmm. And so, and also you've lost so many of the lovely motives. If I write about Queen Victoria's time, you know, I love another, but I am not free. I am the true heir to the fortune. All those things which might've been motives to kill in the past have gone. Um, True. And so, so now it's become much more clinical, I think, to write a mystery these days, and also a lot darker. I think it's harder to have the cozy mystery in the current world because, uh, you know, killing is somehow a lot darker. It's the clever poisonings and the, the speckled band through the keyhole and things, I think, no longer exist. So I think I'm very, no. very comfortable in the past. I think that's, the, mm -hmm. that's, that's fun to do. I, the golden age of mystery definitely had a, a certain aesthetic, but yeah, I do miss it. It's harder. I think you said, as you talk about cozy, it's much harder to suspend disbelief. Yeah. Because, you know, you, these same amateur sleuths keep running across dead bodies and yeah, <laughs> Jessica Fletcher syndrome. Lots of but with yours, you've set them up in good environments for that. You yeah. Know? I was going to say a lot of my mysteries, have a lot to do with the whole concept of class, the whole concept of class, mm -hmm. 
system. Well, you know, for example, above the Bay of Angels is a, a servant girl who's really from a good family who then sort of asserts herself in the world. And uh, so the whole moving through classes and how you're restricted by class. And of course, Molly Murphy books, how you're restricted by gen genre, genre, gender. Okay, it's getting too <laughs> my tongue's freezing up. Um, so, you know, how you're restricted by gender. She's following someone, but she can't go into a tavern or she can't climb over mm. a wall with all those skirts on. You know, all those things um, uh, I like to play with. And of course, none of, the, none of them, too many things these days can be solved with just a simple gun. Shoot someone in the back and that's the end, rather than all these clever murders that came in the golden age. So... I think I'm a throwback to the golden age. I like that, that you have the genteel mystery and you have the servants down below. And um, it's fun to write about. It's fun to visit because it's a safer era in many ways. I think so. I had noted um, in this book, interestingly enough, Georgie says something about the class system. And, and it's a little bit... Um, yeah. I can't I can't remember exactly where it was. You probably remember. Yeah, I mean, but yeah. it, it shows kind of an awakening on Georgie, you know, from the girl who started who could make tea and toast to kind of questioning these very strict class assignments. Yeah. I think it was with her grandfather, because her grandfather is lower class. Granddad. Yeah. 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 Her, her her father was a royal duke, but her mm -hmm. mother was a lower class actress. And so she's poised between these two worlds. And her grandfather he, she brings him to the big house to have Christmas with her. He's clearly very ill at ease because where does he belong? Mm -hmm. you know, he doesn't belong with all these people with titles. On the other hand, he's not a servant, so he doesn't belong in the servants' hall. So he is not very comfortable. And, and George is, I think Georgie says, this is silly. This class system is silly. But, you know, mm -hmm. it, it persists until this day. In England. Oh, absolutely. Oh, got, absolutely. It's still got the same sort of attitudes you know I, I think I told this story once before that I was at a cocktail party in the Coxwolds which is a very snooty area not long ago and the woman who was hosting the party said my dears you'll never guess who's just bought that house across the valley and everybody leaned closer and said oh do tell and she said my dears he's a grocer and it wouldn't have mattered if he owned Safeway to them he was a grocer and therefore not one wow. of them so you know, it's it's interesting that the class system is still very much in evidence in England. That's amazing. Do you ever how how long has it been since you've celebrated Christmas in the in the home country? Do you have you gone back or have you just brought the traditions with you? The only, the last time I celebrated Christmas in the in at home in England was when my kids were young. I think when probably. The, the girls were two, four and six and before Dominic was even born. So that was probably the last time. So many, many years ago now, um, I brought traditions with me. There are certain things the family insists on. One is making mince pies and sausage rolls as, as the snacks. And this, this year we're going to have 15 people at my house for Christmas. So that's an awful lot of sausage rolls and mince pies to make because they do get through them rather quickly. But um, <laughs> Uh, so that will that will be a production line of mince pies. I think my daughter from Phoenix is flying in quite early, so I will have her and granddaughter stand in a line and you know cut out fill plate, cut out fill. You know, we'll, <laughs> so we do that. Um, I we always have a Christmas pudding. I don't make it with no buttons in it. Um, uh, but the interesting thing is that only. John and I like it, so nobody else will touch it. So we have to have, we have it's just tradition. And we have the crackers too, you know, the type you pull and you oh, yeah. get the hat. On. <laughs> you, read, you read all the all the uh, the little riddles inside, like John's mm -hmm. was, where do you find the Andes? And it's the answer is on the end of the wristies. So oh. <laughs> they're all equally um, Yes. And um, so we always have the crackers and then we always play silly games. We always play either charades or we play reverse charades, which are very fun. Like one, everybody has to act it out and one person has to guess. So you have all these people doing this strangely. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that poor person. Pressure. Yeah. 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 That's wonderful. What is on deck for you? I, I see that we're near, getting towards the end. I don't think I have any newer questions just a, a lot of love for you, Reese. We all love your oh, series. Yeah, I wish I could see you. 
give you big kisses. Um, <laughs> I'm hoping next year we can have a real event in person and I can actually give hugs. I miss my hugs. Oh, um, I know. Yeah. Um, so what's next to me is, uh, I say I'm just starting the next Lady Georgie book. Um, I don't have a title mm -hmm. yet. I'd like it to be something to do with Paris, but you know, some someone else keeps stealing all the good Paris titles. So um, mentioning no names. <laughs> um, but um, uh, uh, so I'm thinking of, uh, that's in Paris, and then next, sometime next year. Oh, I've got the the new. Oh, haven't mentioned the new Molly book. So, yeah. Oh, yes. You I'd should tell the, them about that. Put the new Molly Murphy series. I'd put the Molly Murphy series on hold for about four years because I really couldn't write more than two books a year. I would have gone crazy. But my daughter came to me and said, you know, I think I'd like to write the Molly Murphy series with you. I think we could do it together. And so I was unsure, but I said, well, let's give it a try. And it was fabulous. She came up with a really good plot line for the first one. And we started working. We work so well together. We'll talk through a bit and say, well, don't you think after this, she should probably go to that party and then she'll notice that, oh yeah, good idea. And then we work <laughs> we write the scenes and like then it. we go through and edit each other's scenes. And, and she really, I mean, she took the idea and just ran with it. So that next, that book comes out, um, comes out next March and it's called Wild Irish Rose. And um, we're already, we're almost finishing the second one, which is called All That Is Hidden. Oh, you have a copy. Oh, of course. Yeah, wonderful. Thank you so much. Yeah, it's a gorgeous. Thank book. you. <laughs> I, love I love the cover too. So that's it's next really beautiful. And let's hope there might be some in-person events for that. That will be a lot of fun. And then It's a fantastic book. I just have to put that in. Thank you. And then the next, um, the next big standalone will come out, I think, next June. We haven't actually got a date because everything got pushed back a bit because of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. I yeah. Think, and it's going to be called Where the Sky Begins, which um, I like the title. And we're still debating over covers at the moment, so I can't show you one. No, but we talked about the plot, and I can say it's going to be yeah. amazing. Um, yeah, I hope so. hope so, yeah. It's... Um, it's very intense, you know, it's one of those, it's not, it's not a book you're going to chuckle all the way through, I can tell you that. Mm -hmm. Nope. Yeah. Oh, this has been so much fun. Thank you both so much. Uh, everyone, this is an amazing book. It's a perfect gift book. It's a perfect holiday book. Now is the perfect time to get it. And if you buy it from Book Passage, Reese will come and she will sign your book for you. So please yeah. purchase it yeah. online, bookpassage.com. Yeah. You can call I will, I will personalize it for Christmas presents. Think about that. Oh. <laughs> I can't think of a better gift. So please, <laughs> please, we hope you will do that. And I hope you'll read this book and love this book as much as we do here. And we love all of Reese's books. And we're so looking forward to the next uh, Molly Murphy mystery as well. And hopefully, yeah, yeah an in-person event perhaps would be... Uh, Let's hope it's so. possible then let's let's hope and if not we'll see you both here again for sure yeah. um but thank you both so much for being here um if you guys enjoyed this event please consider subscribing to our youtube channel so you can see all of our upcoming events like this and thank you both so much again for this wonderful wonderful conversation well thank you but jen thank you so much for taking the time to interview oh my pleasure yeah i'm looking forward to seeing you in person very soon a couple of weeks from <laughs> now and um, uh, thank you, Zach, for hosting us. And thanks, thanks to Book Passage for all the wonderful things that you do all the time. I mean, what a, yes, treasure, thank you. What a treasure stores like you are to the fact that, you know, that you're there with every book anybody could ever dream of. It's just, it's wonderful. Thank you so much. It is a dream. And thank you, Evan, for watching. And good night or good day. Enjoy the rest of your day. Take care. Thanks. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye-bye.